Market bears piled onto the bean and bean meal markets again today. That kept corn on the defensive for another session, and it helped wheat futures turn mid-morning gains into closing losses. Lean hog futures lower again today, while profit taking stormed into the cattle complex. Live with the Double Dip of Davis via Farm Journal Studios, this is AgriTalk. This afternoon, we chat with our old pal, Scott E. Davis from Bullpen Trading. Directly following the news, Todd Bubba Horwitz from BubbaTrading.com. I'm one of the Davises. Now, here's the host of AgriTalk, Chip Flory. When you said a double dip of Davis, that is something I didn't know if I wanted to be here for or not. (laughs) I'm just, you know. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm just, uh, but no, this is good. This is mm-hmm. good. Scott Davis, Davis yeah. Michelson. Um, I Double don't know and, if I've got yeah. any other Davises, you know, it, like in my life. How many more do you I, need? You know? None. I feel like between me and Scott, <laughs> we've, we've we've got you covered. I think you do. Mm-hmm. I think you do. There's uh, no question about it. So we're good. We're good. Welcome to AgriTalk. I'm Chip. That is Davis. Hello. Uh, boy. Negative signs on the grain markets today. Negative on the cattle complex. A little bit lower in lean hogs. Cotton lower. Just a defensive day all of the way around in the grains yeah. mm-hmm. and livestock. Crude oil, lower. Um, milk contracts were mixed today. A little bit of pressure on the nearby contracts with some strength in the back months. So I guess if we're looking for a silver lining, we got to go to back month milk and soybean oil. Soybean yeah. oil was higher today. So. Yeah. Well, don't yeah. feel bad. I mean, there's an awful lot, awful lot of red between the Dow, the S and P, and the Nasdaq as well today. Yeah. It's a little bit ugly. You're right. You know, maybe that's something that we need to ask Bubba about when we get him on here. Is just he might know. You know yeah. why? Why are some days just defensive in nature? Ooh, good. What what kind of a, you know, what triggers that mm-hmm. attitude where uh, we've got the commodity world on on the defense and equities all at the same time? Let's well, yeah, that. and that's the thing. It's it's like this destroys my theory that well, they they trade stocks until they don't feel good anymore, and then they can just move that money over to commodities. Everybody's right. lower today, straight yeah. down. Everybody, yeah, everybody. It's crazy. All right, let's get yeah. to the market news. Let's what do you do. got? Wheat futures turned mid-morning gains into closing losses, with winter wheat futures pivoting around key levels. July soft red winter wheat futures traded on both sides of 7 bucks for a sixth consecutive session. July hard red winter wheat futures also opened high range and finished with a low range close. USDA now rates 48% of the winter wheat crop in good to excellent condition, down one point from the previous week. The spring wheat crop is estimated to be 88% seeded. That's seven points ahead of the five-year average. July HRW wheat futures were 11 and one half cents lower today, 719 and three quarters. July SRW wheat down seven and a half cents, 692 and three quarters. July spring wheat closed at 752. That's down five and a half today, Chip. Still a lot of attention being paid to what is going on with the Russian wheat crop, the Ukrainian wheat crop. The forecast for the Sukhave winds to kick up and, and bring some additional stress to the wheat crops there. That that talk was still in the market. It just didn't have much impact on trade today. Mm. Well, talk of planting delays was pushed aside again today after USDA reported corn plantings at 83% complete. That as of May 26. That's a point ahead of the five-year average. Showers and above normal rains are generally expected over the next week to 10 days in the Midwest. Some producers are concerned about nitrogen leaching and drowned out spots, but traders clearly optimistic that soil moisture reserves will prevent midsummer stress on most acres old crop corn futures opened near session highs and dropped to close solidly lower near session lows july corn seven and a quarter cents lower 455 and a quarter september down six and a half cents 465 december corn futures closed at 478 and three quarters down six and a half today chip there's a the difference of opinion on the condition of the corn crop is widening mm. <laughs> I don't mm-hmm. think there's any question based on the way that the market is trading and some of the attitudes and and, and concerns, legitimate mm-hmm. concerns that producers have got about the crop. Well, Chip, soybean plantings as of May 26 were 
percent complete. Uh, that's straight in line with the five year average yeah. pace. Soybean meal futures were solidly lower with bean oil futures higher as spreaders exited positions. The drop in bean meal prices pulled bean prices sharply lower for a second consecutive session. July bean futures followed yesterday's downside reversal with an open near session highs and a close near session lows. Bean prices are slicing through support levels with July futures targeting support at the May 14 low of 12.03 and one half. July beans today 15 and a half lower 12.14. August beans down 15 and one quarter to 12, 13 and three quarters. November beans closed at 11, 97, down 15 and a half chip. Yeah, not a lot of fun for the bulls in the bean market when yesterday's downside reversal was confirmed by the follow through selling that we saw today. That was a mm-hmm. tough day for bean bulls. July cotton today was 133 points lower, 81.10 at the close. On your livestock's June fat cattle opened slightly lower and traded sharply lower to spike support at Friday's low before prices recovered to close mid-range. Choice graded boxed beef prices were $1.71 higher, and USDA confirmed a new all-time high in the cash cattle market. But traders today were more interested in profit-taking than in building a bigger long position. Today, June fats were a buck twenty lower at one eighty-three thirty-five. August feeders gave back all of yesterday's sharp gains and posted a downside reversal, finished four thirty-five lower. 260.25. In June, uh, lean hog futures gapped higher, opened near session highs, and fell back to close slightly lower near session lows. June hogs today, two and a half cents lower, all told at 93.77 and one half chip. All right. Thank you very much, Davis. Todd Horwitz, BubbaTrading.com. How you doing, Bubba? Just when you thought it was safe to get back in the water, they slap you down again. How about that? Man, <laughs> what, what is it that triggers a day like today where you've got the commodity world under pressure, you got the equities under pressure? What what triggers this? I know there must have been some news or a lot of profit taking. I mean, the markets are still thin, but I still I'm still pretty confident. The grains still look pretty good. Uh, I know they were bad today, but I, I, you have to ask yourself a question, okay? You got ten trillion dollars in more and more new debt. You got ten million people coming into this country. How are you going to feed them all? Okay, everything else is inflating. Oil is going up. The rest of the commodity world is going up. The only ones that are suffering are the grain markets. So yeah. I have to assume that uh, they will inflate with everything else once they finally get uh, a little bit of fear in them and we see some action. But the the action is still lacking. So the the, the strong hands are still in control. But the trends look not bad, really, Chip. I, I mean, if you look at them. We just pulled back to support, and I think you could rally from here again. Okay. All right. Very good. You know, it, the the attitude toward interest rates is a real mixed bag right now. There are some that are thinking we could see an interest rate increase between now and the end of the year. Is that going to happen? I think so. It should. The bond market's telling you that it's going to happen. I mean, if the Fed's going to continue to – see, if the Fed would just stay out of the way, we wouldn't have these problems. But if right. the Fed's going to mix in, they're going to have to hike because if they're going to want to slow the inflation and they got a break last month with the with the low cost of oil. Well, now oil is back up another 15 percent from its lows. And, of course, that's going to be a big number into the inflation number coming up. Yeah. Yep. You, you are exactly right. And, and uh, I'm becoming more and more convinced and moving over to the Bubba camp that we might be better off without <laughs> that Fed. There's no question. It's it's fun at the Bubba Compound. Come on out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. Good stuff, Bubba. We'll talk to you later. Todd Horowitz, Bubba Trading. Have a great week, guys. Com. Thanks. You bet. You bet. All right. Coming up next, conversation with Scott Davis from Bullpen Trading right here on AgriTalk. Our name says it all. Agritalk. What more do you need to know? I love this one. When I hear the paper hell, Agritalk. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Right? That's right. I mean, I couldn't hardly <laughs> tell the difference well, between. I, mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. Wow. I'm a broadcast professional. You know, this Live is just or Memorex kind of thing. Part of every day for me. It's just what I do. I get it. I, I get can't it. Shut it. I would shut it off if I could. Nobody better. Nobody <laughs> well, better. I don't know. About I that. like that too. But you know, nothing really beats Prince's. Eh. Ooh, yeah. yeah. In, in Kiss, that's my favorite yeah. part. Right. Mm-hmm. Eh. Right. <laughs> that's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's not bad. <laughs> not bad at all. What? 
Welcome back to Agri Talk. I'm Chip. That's Davis. Do you and have a Big favorite Apple musical Joe moment? Stackler. Um, well, it used to be the debate until I so clearly, you know, was victorious <laughs> in what, right. uh, my next 30 years really means. Uh-huh. I, sure. once, once, you know, when you get a win like that uh-huh. in, uh-huh. in, in, in your, uh, on your resume, yeah. how do you really ever go back and, well, and yeah. enjoy things like that again? It's well, just it- really difficult. At that point, exit stage left. You're on a high note. You know, exactly. leave them wanting more. I think you Drop the right. mic and yep. exit stage left. See, Chip knows what do, to do. Do just He's like the own eaters. Unplug and run. <laughs> run, <laughs> run off the stage. Smiling, smiling. Smiling, yeah. <laughs> yep. Let's get him in. Scott Davis, bullpen trading. How you doing, Scotty? I am doing well. I'm just kind of sitting back and listening to all this. It's kind of fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It uh, every now and then it, it uh, just kind of swirls into some some confusion for everybody else out there. I'm sure that it does, but uh, we're happy to clear it up and bring it back to reality. Um, just give me your general impressions of the the way that the grain markets are, and we're going to do this for for the the uh, cattle and and hog markets too. But general impression of how the grain markets are trading right now. What what are you looking for out of these markets? Well, you know, Chip, I, I'll actually start by kind of lumping everything together just a little bit. And I'm going to okay. uh, I, I listened to the part you had on with, with Bubba. And I do think that there was a trigger today that made everything move the same. And that is uh, related to exactly what you were talking about. And that was the, the, the 10 year note. And when we've got interest rates moving up as quickly as they have the last uh, several days with the 10-year note following, falling, and we had another poor auction today, and we have this market (laughs) switching gears, thinking back again from the idea of cutting to to raising interest rates or or whatever we end up doing. Uh, But that move, when it happens suddenly, deflates everything else around the world on the idea that the Fed is going to pull the punch bowl away. Right. And so I think you saw it in almost all commodities, uh, almost all equities, uh, NVIDIA being about the only stock that uh, seems to go up every day. Um, oats were the ones, one of the ones that didn't seem to care, but you know, you didn't have enough volume there to matter. And, and silver apparently still right. playing catch up with gold. Other than that, almost everything else, you can just see whenever the, uh, the 10 year note ticked lower, yields ticked up just a notch, uh, we just pulled money away from everything again. And this seems to be the pattern we were in when we made the lows back in in late February. And and we just have these waves where the money just leaves the system and we're all kind of stuck gasping for our breath to see who's going to buy again. And there's nobody there to buy at the moment. Yeah, interesting. And and the way that the that the the real interest rates are um, influencing trade. Across the board, Scott, I think it's uh, um, I think it's healthy, isn't it? I mean, because it's I, it's I, it's forcing reality. Yeah, and I think it's why we haven't seen rates really move. I mean, I know they move very quickly uh, from the the lows to the level we saw as a percentage basis. But I mean, you and I are just old enough to have lived through some of the rounds of of actual inflation before and and right. the crises that and the shocks to the system and i mean those were shocks to the system we aren't really at an interest rate that should be having this kind of effect but the market is so anticipatory and and by the market i mean all of them together we seem to flip so quickly to what the next big move is going to be that we haven't gone anywhere really right on on interest rates for a while and yet the market has been convinced that, A, there was going to be, uh, you know, more more hikes and then there was more cuts. And now we're back talking more hikes. And the Fed hasn't done anything. They haven't had to. And, and they're letting the market do its job for them, I think, at this point. And I, I, I'm i actually going to be not in your uh, camp with, with, with Bubba at the moment. And I'm okay. going to say the Fed actually has done a pretty decent job as of late letting the market – find its own balance in here. And I think they're going to continue to do that for at least months, most likely post-election by, uh, you know, at least a month or so. I don't think they want to do anything ahead of that, but they aren't going to be opposed to uh, doing a little talking, letting the market get ahead of itself and correcting back. 
And so they're going to probably jawbone it more than they'll actually do anything yeah. and uh, let the market yep. again yep. find its own balance. Yep. And the, the reason they're going to jawbone it is because it's worked in the past. Right. Exactly. Yeah. The, the market's listening and, uh, quite frankly, overreacting to what the actual changes yep. are uh, right now. So, But that does have an effect on all of our markets. And, you know, we can talk about, uh, you know, stocks, bonds, commodities, but it, the commodities are really reacting to it, I think, in part because we have so much managed money that can steamroll any one of us on a daily basis. And, and even any of the commercials can get steamrolled on any given moment um, when the managed money moves in this herd fashion. Uh, and it's why I think we get these, these violently sideways markets. They're going nowhere fast, but they just keep swinging back and forth without actually doing anything. Dude, I'm sitting here grinning because it is Memorial Day week. And we started a market conversation about the grains and didn't start with the amount of rain that we've had in Iowa. Oh, exactly. It, it, uh, it, that's, that's almost shocking. That, Isn't it that crazy? That's, yeah, that that's, that that's how the conversation started. But here we are. Here we are. Whoo, that was refreshing. Thank you. <laughs> you know, and at the moment, I don't know that it, it, it matters to producers. Don't get me wrong. And it's oh, going to yeah. matter to crop. Don't get me wrong. Yep. But I don't think today it matters that much to the market and where prices are at now. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, part of what I think we need to touch on is that when we go back to the idea of the crop and, and, and the rain and everything else is there's a really fine line between too much rain and rain makes grain. And I think, you know, we've had... We, we've strayed on both sides of that line over the last 10 days, and we pulled the plug on that that idea of too much rain with the planning progress, which, right. by the way, includes, you know, the five-year averages include a couple of really slow years on planting. That's right. Uh, so we aren't, we aren't really ahead. There. Yeah, we aren't yeah. really ahead on planning progress. But for most guys, we're not bad. Now, the guys that are, that are stuck right now are literally stuck. And... Yeah. uh you know, it's it's getting pretty serious uh, south of Springfield, Illinois, uh, parts of Iowa. Uh, there's there's some guys who are really wondering what they're going to get in. There's some you know talk of prevent plant yep. for for parts of the Dakotas. Um, we have some even of that eastern every year. Nebraska's in on that. You know, I hadn't heard that. So, yep. how big an area are we talking? Hey, uh, boy, you you pretty much got to hug the river, okay. but. It is in eastern Nebraska. And it, but the thing is, you never talk about prevent plant in eastern Nebraska. That's why it's right. caught my attention. So Sure, sure. Yeah. And we always have some prevent plant. So, I mean, it's yep. not like this is news. It just sucks for the people who have to deal with it. Absolutely. That's exactly right. Exactly right. And if somebody's driving by it every day and they look out there in the field and they see these issues and they see some of these problems – and then they look at what happened with the market, and then corn is is a nickel or seven cents slower. It a lot of that doesn't make sense on a day to day basis, but you it, you almost have to look at it more on a weekly basis, don't you? Yeah, that's probably a good way to say it. Uh, a weekly basis, maybe even monthly. Um, yeah. The problem is, is the markets move so quick at times that the opportunities are gone if you don't at least digest some of it and you have to at least be aware of what's moving in each day whether it's your your issue or not um you know like i said I, I talk about a violently sideways market we are in an upturning channel in both corn and soybeans uh from the you know february lows and we've had our, our little seasonal push uh we should still have some seasonal strength into uh the middle of this month uh june 7th to 9th depending or june june not this month i'm already in my head i'm already switched to june but uh you know we're working our way higher, but we're we're in the middle of a trading range on on beans. We're near the bottom of the trading range on corn as we work our way back up, and we're getting to that time where we're going to have to make some decisions on you know getting some things priced because the clock right. is ticking when you got to have some sales targets in here. And like I said, yep. that rain makes grain attitude can come on really quick once you get things all planted. And we got to be getting to the point where soybean meal is going to be a value buy for. The for, for the livestock guys out there and even some importers of soybean meal, so. but, but maybe we're not there yet. Scott Davis, Bullpen Trading is our guest analyst today. We're going to get back to the conversation 
with Scott in just a moment. Let's go to the markets page at profarmer.com and check today's closes. Where July HRW wheat futures were 11 and one half cents lower at 719 and three quarters. July SRW wheat down seven and one half cents to 692 and three quarters. July corn futures were seven and one quarter cents lower at 455 and a quarter. December corn futures close at 478 and three quarters. That's down six and a half on the day. July soybean futures 15 and one half cents lower at 1214. November beans closed at 1197. That's down 15 and a half on the day. July cotton 133 points lower today to 81 and 10. On your livestock's June fat cattle were a buck 20 lower, 183.35. August feeders finished 435 lower at 260.25. And June lean hog futures two and a half cents lower, 93.77 and one half. Get more, visit tryprofarmer.com. <laughs> Opinions expressed on AgriTalk do not necessarily reflect gotta, the views of Farm Journal Broadcasting, affiliate stations, or sponsors. Ah. Now listen. I'm probably not supposed to talk over that part. You should try it. You should. You got one? Here, I'll do this. I ain't doing it. Huh? I ain't doing right. it. No. Not after Joe's no. stellar performance earlier. Right, exactly. How do you we follow up Big Apple Joe? You no, can't top that's that. right. No. No. And I'm sure that he's going to say, well, that was just a coincidence that that bump came on. Uh-huh. Yeah. Sure. I'm putting yeah, air quotes yeah. on that. It's it's all random. All mm-hmm. random. I'm sure mm-hmm. that's what he's saying. Yeah, yeah, that's what he'll say. Welcome back to AgriTalk. I'm Chip. We're in the middle of a conversation with Scott Davis. Bullpen trading. Um Scott, let's uh I I want to talk about demand. Uh, okay. And I want to talk about <laughs> The, the attitude of what is going on with demand in the soy complex, soybeans, whether it be old crop exports, new crop exports, because if there's one thing that I see in that market that really concerns me about the where this where bean prices might be headed, you got to look straight at the export market, don't you? Absolutely. And, you know, I guess the only if you want to try to put the spin on this, you could argue that the only positive thing about that right now is that there's no room for cancellations. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah I, I don't mean to be ordinary, but I, that, you know, it's so early. I, I know we should have a lot on the books and we don't have any in the books. And that is very scary, and there's been no consistent buying. We've got all these things going on here, uh, and, and that's really a problem if it persists. Okay. Uh, I can't help but wonder if we are uh, we're falling prey to trying to compare to the past, and I I think a lot of markets have changed. Um, starting, I don't know if it happened with Trump or ahead of that, or if it was already shifting. Um, but the trade war clearly shifted trade patterns around the world. Uh, the U.S. is no longer the prime supplier of the world. I'm not saying anything shocking there, but I think we forget that. And we are the supplier that the world comes to yeah. when Brazil's out, uh, when South America doesn't have available grain or when Ukraine doesn't have available grain or Russia. You know, we are not the cheap supplier. We're hopefully the premium uh, that's debatable at times on uh, versus Brazil and beans, but we are the overflow. And yeah. I don't like that being the fact, but it is, it, it's reality today. Yeah. Uh, that means we don't sell anything until they're sold out. Yep. Yep. And when they're sold out, ours suddenly has a lot more value. Mm-hmm. Now, fortunately, most of our use on the corn side and, and, uh, you know, big, big chunk on the beans is domestic. Mm-hmm. And so we do have a demand base that's here, that's intact, and that, uh, quite frankly, has been growing. And with with uh, biodiesel or, or uh, you know, sustainable aviation fuel or whatever you want to go with for the future, we should have some additional growth, which will keep that meal cheap, by the way, uh, yeah. for the hog guys. But, you know, it, it we are growing our domestic base. We're going to need to because we are not going to be the dominant world supplier for export yeah. needs. 
Okay. It changes how things trade and it makes yep. it more dire when somebody else has a problem. We have to pay attention to it. And I think that is probably really critical when we think about marketing in that in the past, we focused a lot more on our crop conditions at the end of May. You talked about how we started this first segment, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. talking about weather here and our conditions. I, I think we've become less important. Um, it's still very important for the producers involved, but for the market as a whole, we have to be at least as aware of what's happening with the Black yeah. Sea region, with, with uh, uh, you know, the, the flooding that was in Rio Grande de Sul that helps, you know, move the yeah. market higher. Uh, those disruptions can all of a sudden send serious export demand our way that gets rid of that extra supply in a heartbeat. Yeah. So we have to be aware of those. But we have to understand when they don't happen, we're not going to get the business. Okay. All right. I, I, I like that line of thought, which brings me to explain to a Midwest row crop producer why they need to pay attention to what's going on in the wheat market. Because of wheat substituting for corn. Mm -hmm. um, that's become such a, a powerful force when Russia was, I, I suspect, I don't, you know, I don't know this. I have, I've seen a lot smarter people than me argue it. So I'm willing to piggyback on them that mm -hmm. Russia was selling, dumping wheat on the world market at a price point to help fuel some of their war. And if that's the case, they didn't care who they displaced on, on supply you know, demand and right. part of what they did displaced was our corn demand. And so some of the growth we've seen in, in feed consumption around the world was in wheat. As that supply tightens up, uh, corn suddenly is competitive again and corn has a market. I think it's why we're seeing some of the demand base. We are our biggest customer has been Mexico and Mexico's yeah. in the middle of a horrific drought. Uh, it, it has not been fixed. It is still ongoing. It's in multiple years. You know, we're in what year four of the Kansas drought where you can kind of extend it down into Mexico is what it amounts to. Right. Right. And, and, and as long as that's the case, we're going to continue to have that really good buyer and the corn demand side probably is going to hold things together better than people think. But right now, in spite of that, the reason the corn guys should look at wheat is because wheat has become, it was corn's worst enemy in 2022. Yeah. In 2023, okay. and starting about three months ago, corn started to become, or wheat started to become corn's best friend. Yeah. And it's trying to pull us along to the party, but it's not having much luck yet. Right. Right. Yep. Corn's still a little antisocial. Wheat's the party, <laughs> party girl going out, going out for drinks. And she'd yeah, like to bring us along. That's the way she's always been. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then she drinks too much and then she has a hangover and it's all ugly. Yeah. Yes. That's right. That's right. Okay, let's go over to the, the livestock trade here, buddy. Um, you got a note in, in the email that you sent me. What is this about ractopamine in, in Greeley? Uh, the only thing I've seen is that the JBS plant in Greeley has apparently been shut off from exports uh, to China because of ractopamine uh, found in the Greeley beef plant. Uh, that came out, that was rumored today. It was the break in the market, I believe. Uh, it also coincided, though, with the the, the interest rate-inspired break in all commodities. Um, not that it caused the interest rate. It was the other way around. Right, uh, right. But, but uh, I don't know that that should have any significant longer-term impact. But, you know, you, the cattle market is, A, at extremely high levels and very frothy and due to being prone to, uh, you know, rumors. Uh, yeah. So when you get that kind of rumor out there, you you have the, the buyer interest just evaporate, just in case. And yeah. uh, then there were other rumors of some more bird flu stuff, and I don't know what, which was true or not. But I do know that that, uh, that ractopamine announcement did come out later. So I think the rumor mm -hmm. earlier in the session probably had it mostly traded today. Uh, you okay. know better than I do how much that would turn into, but I can't imagine that it would significantly impact our export situation. Well, it's just good to see that the live cattle market is still sensitive to headlines. You know, I was starting <laughs> to lose faith. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I do think goodness. it's interesting. I, I I got a chance to listen to some of the show uh, uh, yesterday and, and talking about the beef side of things and demand. And, you know, one thing I wanted to, I, I know what I made at that point is that I've been thinking a lot about, and I don't, claim to have this all figured out, but I do think that we have to bear in mind the changes in inflation 
and what that does mean to beef prices. And I, I'm not about to go down that rabbit hole of claiming that, you know, corn should be at $20 a bushel because if you inflate yeah. the 1972 price to whatever, because that clearly hasn't happened. It's not going to happen. The rest of the market doesn't support it. But I think on the meat side of things, meats have to be more sensitive to inflation than uh, corn or beans. Um, sure. Yep. Just because it's kind of more like the CPI versus the PPI, the consumer price versus producer price, you're a lot closer to the final stage there on on beef. There isn't a lot of further processing done to <laughs> to a T bone. Um, so you know when we talk about record cattle prices and record beef prices, are they really? Uh, you know the consumer is paying twelve bucks to go get a fast food meal. Is right. does does the fact that uh, that beef goes from eight to nine bucks a pound matter that much for them, depending on the cut? I mean, I, it to me it it's uh, it's justifiable inflation with cattle pushing to the levels they are, and I think it can continue maybe longer than what we think it can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's and it the thing that that concerns me the most on that is the cumulative effect of the inflation and the affordability issues that a lot of families are dealing with right now oh it's uh, horrific yeah. yeah where they've got to make choices between you know it i, I don't want to say between food and fuel that's not it it's what they're doing with car insurance it's what right. they're doing with kids camps it's what mm -hmm. they're doing with you know stuff that we like to enjoy inflation's and, painful and, yes and, and, it, and it's and it hits so differently across the income spectrum, and 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 most of us in ag are are remarkably well off compared to the average person out there. Yep. And uh, we we have benefited quite frankly from some of the inflation in the past. We get in squeezed at times. Don't get me wrong, I get it. But um, you know, spend a little time with some folks uh, who are lower in the income scale, and it it this is tough. Yeah, yeah, it it absolutely is, and. And uh, something that uh, we need to keep in mind as we're going forward here. Dude, it's always fun to have you on here. Uh, thank I, you so much for making time. I appreciate it. Uh, I will end with one little plug. Yeah. Five years five years ago tomorrow, I went into surgery for colon cancer. Yeah. And uh, I am remarkably blessed and, and survived perfectly. But if you are 45 or older... Get your colonoscopy. If you have family risk, do it sooner. It saved my life. Put a smile on my face, buddy. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Thanks you. a lot. All right. Scott Davis, Bullpen Trading. Uh, when we come back, Davis and I are going to try to pull some highlights from that conversation and put a wrap on today's AgriTalk. Al Davis Michelson. Chip Flory joins me as well. You endorse that comment, Chip? Absolutely. No. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Um, you know, speaking of which, uh, I I've, I've had a colonoscopy. You've had yours. Yes. Yes. Got to have them, people. You got to have them. Yeah, you got to get them um, done. Scott Davis is is literally living, breathing proof of uh of why you, exactly. you got to get it checked out. You got to get it checked out. Exactly. That's all. Well, yeah. uh, you know, I've known Scott long enough and have been his friend um long enough it, it, we we go all the way back to uh 1985 when iowa when state we were at, right yeah when we were at iowa yeah. state together uh we were working at woi radio together over there and then we worked together for at oster communications um gosh until 2000, something like that, uh, after after we got out of school. Uh, so we we spent some time together, including including uh, the time that we lost Scott's dad. Um, you know, mm -hmm. his family lost John way too soon, and 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 you know we all did. 
we all did and and it was to cancer and and so uh scott's got it in his family and he's getting checked out and if you've got it in your family Mm -hmm. you should be getting it checked out too and even if you don't it does not hurt to be certain that's right that's right yep okay uh we do we keep steering into the rhubarb today i don't know what's happening is it friday (laughs) it must be friday is it friday did we do the free for all it's wednesday how did i do how are the royals seems like no um todd horowitz that's a sure sign of wednesday todd horowitz yeah grains pulled back to support on this move could go higher well um he he seems uh, a part of him i will say it seems a little bit unconcerned with this move and even says well this may be productive right right and we we heard some of that from scott as well as he was talking about you know, look at the longer term trends. We've still got some uptrends that are in pa- in place longer term. So we've got to keep that in mind as we look at these setbacks. And we need to do some measurements. Uh, there's going to be some Fibonacci retracements that are taking place. Mm-hmm. There's going to be, let's go back and fill some gaps. Let's go back and test some uptrends. Let's back and fill and let the market reset and potentially move higher from there. I mean, it's just like the equities are doing. You've got the down now. It wasn't that long ago that we busted 40,000 for the first time. Now we're under 38.5 and, and almost 400 points lower today. And I kind of look at it and I'm not that far away from when I'm going to need some of those funds mm-hmm. from, yeah. from uh, stock investments. And I sit here and I look at that and go, eh, you know, it's it's a setback, yeah. It's it's gonna crack, uh, but uh, uh, you, you know, until you start getting into the bear market range of mm-hmm. of a twenty percent correction or fifteen percent correction, it's really difficult to get too shook up about it. Yeah, in the big yeah. picture. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Indeed. Um, the ten year note is a is a big thing that uh, mm-hmm. keeps coming up. Scott called it called it the trigger today he was he was willing to put it out there and and say that you know it was it was the 10-year note talk about that right right well it's it's the real interest rate market calling the shots rather than the 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 fed jawboning right trying to direct things in one direction or another so when you've got when you've got the the real interest rate market that is having that much influence on on the commodities and and even on equities, I I'm going to argue that it's healthy, that that it is healthy for the overall marketplace, and it is it it's the kind of thing that makes me think, okay, if we do go through this kind of a setback in the Dow, it's not going to be a long term you know, long drawn out downside mm-hmm. correction in this, this market. But it, you know, we, we, you do have to bring the, the fed jaw boning and the fed speak into the conversation again, just simply because, you know, the, 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 the market bulls in equities have been drinking from the fed spigot for so long that if they start to turn off some of the, some of the, you know, um, cheaper money, which mm-hmm. you know I get it, interest rates are higher than what they were two years ago. I don't think, and Scott kind of alluded to this. I don't think that means that interest rates are high. Mm-hmm. It just means that they're higher. Right. So there's still. There, there, there's still um, uncertainty looking forward on, is it time for that Fed cut? Or it, there's still room to allow for some conversation about a higher or yeah. an interest rate hike at some point. You know, mm-hmm. it's interesting. Well, it's can- and, Yeah. And I, I got to say, if if the Fed can at least make the markets move one way or the other by just talking isn't that a better and less permanent solution than actually doing something? That yeah, suddenly makes a ton of sense to me, you know? 
Just yeah. talk about it. That's fine. Just don't yeah. do anything. Yeah, well, it prevents you from having to do anything. And, and well, there's that. But we could have brought this all back to a fiscal monetary policy or a fiscal policy rather than a monetary policy conversation mm. and just mm -hmm. and, and said we still have a spending problem that needs to be fixed in this country. And we're uh, I don't yeah. know how close we are to fixing that. National yeah. Weather Service 6 to 10 day outlook June 4th through the 8th. Above normal temperatures expected over most of the country, um, in, including the Corn Belt. On the precipitation side, below normal precipitation hey. is pushing off to the west. Near normal precip, eastern North Dakota, eastern South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, southern Minnesota, uh, and, and western Illinois, northern Missouri. And above normal precip expected east of, it, well, in the eastern Corn Belt. So lots going on there. We're going to talk more interest rates tomorrow morning. Bill Elliott, Unlimited Funds.